hi everybody welcome to the uea nursing podcast uh, my name is joe ellis gage and we have a meet the lecturer episode um and today we're with morag hi morag hi so thanks for coming in um sure. at these sort of these are like informal chats where we get to find out a little bit about the team who work within the the, the school of health sciences and with more sort of specifically within sort of nursing teams and get to find out a little bit about you sure. so before we start drilling you with questions perhaps you could just introduce yourself and tell us what your role is here absolutely so first of all thanks for inviting me mm -hmm. um so i'm morag farker i am professor of palliative care research here in the school of health sciences which means that i've got a split sort of role between some teaching and some research yeah. i lean slightly more towards the research side yeah okay great so you're quite an uh, an interesting person to come on at this point because we've up until now primarily had lots of the um, nursing lecturers who are primarily teaching based and primarily on the undergrad BSc kind of program. Okay. And we're now branching out and trying to include as many people as of interest as possible. Right. So you might be a, a, a more different sort of role than we've had sure. people talking about before. Yeah. Um, so what we often do is start right back at the beginning and think, <laughs> how did you even get to this point? Yeah. Um, and talk about your kind of your decision to get into obviously healthcare and education. So where did that start out? Yeah, okay, so I am a nurse by background, but it is so far in the background, I often don't even mention it. Okay. Um, so I did one of the really early nursing degrees. I did mine at King's College in London. Um, which was the luxury back then of a four-year degree with right. honours, and we were supernumerary on the wards and all that kind of stuff. Because it was quite new and because it was led by folk who were quite well-known nursing researchers at the time, yeah. um, it had a huge research element in it. And okay. I just got the research bug. I loved it. Right from the start. Right from the get-go. So I did practice, but I only actually practiced for about a year. Okay. Um, and I did it in order to fund a master's. Yeah. Um, so I did my master's in, oh, it was something funny like sociology with special reference to medicine, but it taught you about research methods in more detail than I'd done in my degree. Okay. So I did that alongside doing bank nursing yep. to fund it. Um, and then I just got a series of research jobs. Um, interestingly, the first one was linked to nursing. It was an evaluation of... Um, nurse practitioner role, mm -hmm. um, which back then, this was is going thing. 40 years ago, was a really new thing. So, yeah, it was quite a sort of vanguard project. Yeah. Anyway, so did that, but then from that moved into sort of more generic health services research type projects. Yeah. So did a lot of um, work on uh, projects related to older people, um, moved around a few universities, did my PhD, yeah. um, which was on looking at quality of life measurement in older people. Mm -hmm. Um, back then when I did it, it was the quality of life was a very new thing, but it was quite a buzz phrase yeah. that was around. So it was sort of being used inappropriately. And that's one of the things my PhD looked at. Um, and I really carried on as what I would call a health services researcher yeah. for a good 20, 30 years. Um, and then an opportunity came up at UEA to apply for a lectureship. Somebody yep. I knew was here, encouraged me to go for it. Um, they were particularly wanting people with a, a bit of nursing background. Mm -hmm. So I applied and I got that. So that was in 2016. Um, and then since being here, I was promoted to professor a few years later. I can't yep. remember when. Um, yeah, and I have got the title of palliative care research because most of my research in the last 20 years has been in the supportive palliative okay. end-of-life care space. Um, and that is pre predominantly what I do now in my research right that's really interesting so you've kind of gone down a really interesting route to get Bit different. to here yeah yeah, yeah so yeah. going like back to that start bit i'm interested in a couple of things that you said which i find interesting first of all what was it that made you go and do nursing in the first place like was it yeah. a, a family thing that kind of made you go yeah, and do that degree yeah, in the first yeah. place or so this is really cheesy um <laughs> there was used to be this series on bbc called angels right it was in the 70s and uh, I loved it. And it's nothing like what nursing is like, but no. it kind of got my attention. Yeah. Uh, there were one or two people in the family who'd been nurses, but no nobody immediately close, kind of back in, you know, back yeah. generation. So it was kind of there in the background. I toyed with that or teaching was one of the two things because yeah. uh, my mother was a teacher. Um, I wanted to sort of go the sort of 
what I would have called the traditional route of going to a school of nursing, yeah. but had quite a steer from parents to say you ought to go to university. Mm -hmm. And it was when these new degrees were coming out, so kind of killed two birds with one stone. Yeah. Um, so I kind of ended up on this nursing degree, not expecting to have this switch in my brain yeah. in relation to research. So no. I wasn't looking to be a researcher. You I was looking to be, be a nurse. nurse. I was going to be a nurse. Having said all of that, thinking about where I am now and the research I'm doing, if I'd stayed in nursing, I'm pretty sure I would have been in the palliative care space or older people because I'm always, I've always been drawn to those projects yeah. in a research capacity. Um, and I think it's where nursing can have massive value. Yeah. And how was the degree that was the new entry at that point received when you did your training? I'm just thought it was yeah, people were quite sceptical. Yeah. Um, so those who were on the more traditional route or the sort of, you know, established staff nurses on the ward were always a bit, oh, it's the king's students. You know, okay. We were a little bit different. Um, but, it, you know, people got used to it and it's just, it's the way it is now, isn't it? Yeah. It's completely different. But yeah. we were different. We didn't, it was funny because we didn't quite fit with the other student nurses. We also didn't quite fit with the other students on campus. So we were yes. kind of caught between two worlds you were your own thing yeah like. yeah and we're kind of making it up as we went along but yeah it was it was good fun I really enjoyed the degree and I wouldn't even though most of my career has been in research and I, I've done very little clinical nursing mm. I wouldn't have not done the nursing for anything because it was a fantastic foundation yeah for what came forward um after that so yeah I'm really glad I did it yeah, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't done it I don't know what I'd have been doing no, so, I mean, yeah. we never know, do you, where no, you end up no, or no, what no, you no. ended up? No, no, no. Yeah, no. yeah well, I think finding people's backgrounds as to why they want into nursing yeah. is always really interesting. Yeah. And Actually, this is just reminding me, I had a vague interest in hotel and catering as well. And I oh, did, did you? I got offered a place at South Bank to do a catering degree as well. Um, so I was kind so of... So where would you have been if you'd done a catering I know. degree? What would you oh, have ended up... Exhausted. Doing, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm glad I didn't do that. that yeah. was the, wrong the teaching decision. option is interesting. So a lot of people yeah. say, I thought nursing or teaching. Yeah, but I was thinking like primary school teaching. I wasn't thinking higher education mm. teaching. And I kind of have fallen into the higher education teaching yeah. because of coming here. And yeah. it was I needed to be able to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's been a steep learning curve. Yeah. But, yeah, I enjoy uh, it. I, I started out to be a primary school teacher. Did you? Yeah. Okay. And then went, oh, no, this isn't for me. <laughs> um, and my mum was a teacher as well, like you were saying. Yeah. Um, I didn't yeah. really hadn't have considered nursing until a few years later. I came back into university and then went to nursing at oh, that point. Oh, wow. Interesting. So a different kind of route in. But there's a few yeah. people I've spoken to, and I guess the nature of getting to lecturing is that they often said, oh, I thought about maybe being a teacher. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. In, in terms of um, your research, mm. a lot of people watching this will know the word and won't <laughs> really know yeah. what it is, yeah. how you get into it, yeah. and yeah. how it links into current practice. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, okay. about that. Okay. So... Some people are a bit scared of the word research, and mm -hmm. they shouldn't be. It's really about just having a, a bit of an inquisitive mind. Um, it's about answering questions. And one of the things that when I talk to students who are doing projects or other people who are doing projects and I ask, you know, what's your project about? One of the things that um, I love is if they come back to me with what the question is. So what it is they're trying to answer, because a mm. question should drive everything in a research project. So if you've got your research question, what yeah. is it you're trying to answer? Everything else in terms of how you go about answering it, the methods and the analysis and all of that stuff just should follow naturally. So, for example, if I said to you, Joe, what, tell me about your research project. What I don't want to hear from you is, well, I'm doing a research study of X, Y, Z. I want to hear what the question is yeah. because everything else just follows on. And that's the bit that kind of excites me. So you have this problem or this um area you're not sure about in front of you you formulate it into a question and you try and come up with a way of answering that question and that could be through looking at existing research that's out there so mm -hmm. doing some sort of literature review or it could be doing what we call an empirical study where you go out and you collect new data yeah that's the bit i really love i love collecting data because i love talking to people mm -hmm. which i think comes from that nursing background yeah, yeah. um i could sit on somebody's bed and chat to them for hours um so it's just about being inquisitive, um, really having a thirst for knowledge related to your question yeah. and then coming up with ways of answering it and doing that in an imaginative way sometimes. So particularly when you're working in a space like palliative and end of life mm. care, 
where people's time is really precious. Um, you're so grateful to them for taking part in your project when they've got so much else going on that you need to sometimes be imaginative about how you engage with them um, to make sure you make the best use of their time. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so you'd say that the the focus of the research is not actually the nuts and bolts of how you've pulled it all together. It's the what are you trying to actually do? Absolutely. And find out yeah. what's your outcome? What's your question? What? Yeah. outcome are we going to get to at the end absolutely and the bit in the middle is the bit that people are scared of <laughs> that's the bit they're scared of but actually it should flow quite naturally once you get the question sorted out yeah and that's the bit that people often trip up on they think oh i've got to design a study but hang on what is it you're trying to answer and then it'll it will flow from there yeah yeah so in in terms of our like undergrad students who are doing maybe their literature review projects in yeah. their third year they yeah. find it quite intimidating yeah and you just go that's a, that's the point we often place them is just think of your issue think of your problem yes. and think what you yes. want to find out the bits in the middle we can kind of teach you oh yeah that's and it's straight fairly forward. structured yeah yeah but you need to come up with something you're really interested in yes that you have a passion for yeah. and i think that's the key thing with any research you've got to have an interest and a passion this inquisitive mind i talked about but for me it is absolutely converting that problem into a question and often because i supervise many of those yeah. dissertations mainly at postgrad level but um it's really hammering back to students what i mean by question is something with a question mark at the end yeah. so you ask for a question and they keep coming back to you with just a statement no i want a question yeah and then it sort of somehow that opens it up and they go oh okay i get it now so yeah yeah that's a, i've had a similar thing where you get people who just say yeah. my question my question is uh, an exploration is no 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 that's not your, a question <laughs> your question is what are the what is the impact of yeah. or what is that yeah. exactly exactly yeah yeah interesting yeah, yeah. and how about the one thing that when you talked about precious people's time in terms of palliative care, mm. how do you kind of consider the the, the ethics of it, the the, mm. the time you're spending with them? Sure. The, the, how does that work? Yeah, big, big question. Really important question. It's actually unethical not to invite them to take part is the way that I look at it. And yep. actually the way that re there's a whole research literature on this, you know, should we be doing research on these people or inviting them to take part? And actually it's not fair not to ask them because those that do take part seem to get something out of it. It's almost like it's something yeah. that they can contribute still, even though they're very unwell. Um, if it's a question that they think is important, they want to contribute to improving Ooh. the knowledge. If it's Even if it's something they've had a difficult experience of, they want that experience to be better for other people. Yeah. Um, it's also that kind of giving something back people want to do. Yeah. But there have been whole research projects done on whether or not we should be doing research on people with palliative and end of life care yeah, needs. Yeah, because you can see that some people might instantly go, well, why yeah. should you be bothering them and yeah. doing all that with them? Absolutely. But I mean, you know, when I first got into this sort of space about 20, 30 years ago, um, ethics committees were quite nervous. Mm. Whereas now, you know, we then, then went through a phase where we would tell them about these studies that have been done that said that people wanted the opportunity to at least consider yep. taking part in these projects. Um, now it's just accepted that yeah. it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to give people the opportunity. And obviously there's all sorts of issues around how you support people to do that because they are in a difficult space sometimes. Mm. Um, and just being sensitive to things like the burden you place on them. So we have to be quite agile in terms of how we design studies, yeah. giving people lots of breaks and opportunities to, to do so if they need to. Um, if you're doing something like running a randomised controlled trial where some people are getting an intervention, some aren't, making sure those that aren't are still well supported. Yeah. You know, there's lots of ethical debates. In fact, I do a teaching session about ethics in palliative care research yeah um nice. that goes through all those things yeah, yeah it's interesting I, I used to work as in as a clinical trials nurse so in oh, hospital did you? Okay. Sort of carrying up and within did adults and, and kids but primarily i did um, pediatrics and often you'd get a little bit of pushback of well i think this person's mm. too too unwell to be approached or yeah they're a bit young and you go oh yes but if we don't ask them Exactly. What, what, what next? We don't get exactly. any information. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And often when we're sort of, because when, when we do a research study, as you'll know, but just for those who are listening, you have what's called inclusion and exclusion criteria. So it's how you decide who goes into a study and who should yeah. be excluded for important reasons. And often at the bottom of one of those little tables where you present those, we'll include a comment, please don't exclude someone on the grounds that you think blah, yeah. blah. Um, because otherwise what we end up with is a sort of, um, a population taking part in a study that don't reflect yes. the whole of the population. So our findings are then not 
relevant to everybody, which actually makes the project a bit of a waste of time. Yeah. And that is unethical because some people will have taken part. So there's a massive ethical debate around it. But um, I feel very comfortable inviting people, giving people mm. the opportunity. That's what it's about. It's a voluntary thing. Yeah, they can say no. They can say no. And they can also withdraw partway through. Yeah. They can change their mind. That's absolutely fine. But I think everybody should be given the opportunity. Yeah. 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 And so then following on from that, how over the years have you seen work you've been involved in kind of move on after your study, after your research and maybe mm. be implemented, have influence on practice? Have you kind of yeah. got some examples of that? Yeah. So... Often one project leads to another that leads to another that leads to another. Yeah. So to give you one example, um, I was I led a big study oh, 10, 15 years ago looking at care and support for people with advanced COPD, chronic mm. lung disease, um, because palliative and end-of-life care for people with chronic conditions tends to not be as good as for those with the cancer diagnosis. Yeah. It's just not as sophisticated and not as well supported. Um, and one of the outcomes of that was um, identifying that actually patients aren't very well supported and we need a mechanism to help them be better supported, help them sort of tell healthcare professionals what it is they were concerned about and to come up with ways to address their support needs. Yeah. Um, when we were doing that study, we we spoke to both patients and to their unpaid family carers, so family members who were supporting them at home. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we used a tool called the CESNAT, which stands for the Carer Support Needs Assessment Tool, C-S-N-A-T. Okay. Um, and it's a set of 15 questions that you can ask a carer to identify different areas of support need they had. And we thought, this is fantastic. We used it as a basis for our interviews with carers. Um, and then at some point, we had this light bulb moment we need this for patients. Yeah. We need to know what patient support needs are. So this led to a series of research projects to develop an intervention called SNAP, which stands for the Support Needs Approach for Patients. Okay. You can Google it. Um, and we've ended up developing a whole intervention for patients, um, which includes 15 evidence-based questions for patients to think about different areas of support need they might have. And they can complete the little booklet that the mm -hmm. SNAP tool sits inside, take it to a consultation, and talk to the clinician about what their concerns are. And it's a way of sort of, it's like a sort of communication tool, yeah. um, but a way of starting a conversation about their support needs. Yeah. So that whole process of developing that tool and that intervention took about 10 years. But what's really exciting now is that it's being used internationally. It's been okay. translated into several languages. We've adapted it for mental health. So we've just mm -hmm. literally, as of last month, got a mental health service user version. And we've just got funding to go and try it out in prisons. Oh, wow. I know. It's a bit wow. Yeah. yeah. So it's a completely different space than I've worked in before. We've got some fantastic prison nurses on the team working mm -hmm. with us and people who've done research in prisons before because, um, you know, our, our, our SNAP team hasn't done yeah. that before. Um, but, yeah, it's, so it's really exciting. Um, so And it's essentially it's a way of trying to make care more person-centered because the care you provide is related to what it is that patient thinks is in what yeah. support they think they need um so yeah but yeah. so that's a was a long trajectory to get to this intervention that's being used internationally yeah but is, over you can see over that time how you've got sort of a direct benefit yeah. for for patients absolutely absolutely kind of and i've got some fantastic stories from clinicians who've used the intervention with their patients even patients they've known for 20 years so classically yeah. a, 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 this practice nurse we were working with who did those sort of annual reviews with copd patients mm. uh once a year and they should have patients come back and back and back and she thought she knew them really well because she'd been working with them all yeah. these years she then tried out our intervention and learned things she didn't know wow. about these okay. people and ended up putting different support in place for them and changing their care which as a researcher you just think wow that's amazing yeah we came up with this thing that's actually changing practice yeah um yeah Interesting. Mm. And do you ever get research that then leads to nowhere or doesn't give you the yeah. outcome that you were expecting? Or It's not so much that it doesn't give you the outcome you're expecting or it leads nowhere. It's more that to get the funding for research mm -hmm. is really difficult. Um, it's a massive persuasion exercise essentially in yeah. terms of when you go to a funding panel to get the money. And sometimes maybe we've not been as good at as others in terms of getting the funding yeah. which can be frustrating but you do you can't do every project so there are some that fall behind yeah. um 
You know, I always like to think they could be there for somebody else in future to pick up and run with. But things change and environments change and, yeah, you can't do it all. Yeah. And you just – you do have to kind of accept that. When we do have failures with funding or, or what? no, we rather call it unsuccessful funding bids mm -hmm. – Usually what happens is if we think it's a good idea and we've had some good feedback, we will rework it and apply somewhere else for the funding. Yeah. But it doesn't always happen. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. But with yeah. the SNAP work, it wasn't all funded first time around. We had to do several goes with different funders until yeah. we found the right home for it. Yeah. Really. Yeah. You have to so, work yeah. hard at the behind the scenes it's stuff before you even hard. get oh, going yeah. with it. Oh, it's years yeah. to get the funding. Yeah. 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 And then I guess you've given us a really good kind of overview of kind of what you do and how it works. But what would you say to people who think, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. This might be something yes. I'd like to get towards doing, but I don't yeah. really know. Yeah. They might be registered nurses who are already out practicing. They might be people who are still doing their nursing training or uh, off doing a different route slightly. Yeah. What sort of advice would you, would you give to them? Everybody who is a healthcare professional or aspiring to be a healthcare professional needs to know about and understand research yeah doesn't mean you have to do research mm. um you need to at least at the basic level be a consumer of research because healthcare is an evidence-based profession that evidence yeah. predominantly comes from research and you need to know what's good research and what's not so good research you need to be able to be critical um be able to judge mm -hmm. the research that's in front of you not just take uh, a published paper at face value you need to be able to read it with a critical eye yeah. so you need some sort of basic research skills or understanding of the research process and what's good practice and what's perhaps not so good practice to yeah. understand where you know just how confident you can be in the findings that you read about because you don't want to put something into your clinical practice if actually the research behind it isn't that strong yeah you need to be confident in it now there's lots of ways you can do that confidently by working with things like nice guidance mm -hmm. because they've done that job for you yeah but there isn't nice guidance on everything and also sometimes it goes out of date so i would just encourage everyone who is either in healthcare or a healthcare student to get comfortable and confident with a basic understanding of yeah. research so that you can deliver that evidence-based practice. Yeah. 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 So you can kind of, if someone came up to you and said, why are you doing it this way? Yeah. You can kind of explain yeah. why. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You've got that sort of evidence behind you. It's your backup. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Know, Without the answer being, yeah. because we've always done it this way. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So get an understanding of research, some of the strengths, limitations of particular studies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Think about how that really links to your work. Absolutely. And then I guess if research is something you're interested in, you can pursue that yeah. yourself. So I slightly dodged that question because there are yeah. so many different routes you can go. Well, yeah. The route I did is untraditional. Yeah. So I kind of almost stepped back from nursing and did this health services research stuff. And then I've kind of come back into it mm. um, because a lot of my research now is quite nursing related whereas yep. it wasn't for a while okay um what often happens is sometimes people will go down the sort of research nurse route yep. which wasn't available when because i'm ancient um yep. but that's much more of a career path now and there are also these fantastic clinical academic pathways you can go on yeah. funded by the nihr none of that was around when when i was doing my training um so there are loads of opportunities of out there. it's in. really different now yeah absolutely and there are some fantastic examples of people from uea who, who've done some yeah. of those pathways um which you you should get some of those guys on yeah. this uh, and speak to them it would yeah. be really good yeah that's good yeah. yeah so basically kind of go and uh immerse yourself in what is interesting to you and explore it yeah yeah great talk to, to find other people who are doing what it is you want to do so if you see someone who's in a sort of clinical academic role who's managing to keep working in clinical practice alongside doing research mm. then go and talk to them and pick their brains or yeah yeah yeah, yeah. great well Thank you very much. My pleasure. I think we've kind of yeah. covered what we want to cover, found out a bit about you, but found out a lot about research and what you do. Great. Um, so thank you very much for coming in. It's my pleasure. Enjoyed it. Great. Um, hopefully you have watched this and found this interesting. Um, if you have um, any questions, you can um, put them on the, the chat below the uh, video, share the video with anyone else who might be of interest and explore the site for any other videos you may not have seen yet. Um, so thanks again. My pleasure. Thanks.